Okay. This morning, we've talked many a time, what's the best way that the gospel is going to be spread? Is it, there's lots of good ways, but is it going to be from the pulpit? Is it going to be from articles in the newspaper? Is it going to be from billboards, classrooms? What's the best way to, we're going to spread the gospel? Each one of us, every day, how we live and who we talk to. And of course, as I was talking to someone earlier this week, is it what you always say that teaches faster? Or is it what you do and how you act? You're being watched. If you say one thing and do another, they're watching that do another probably more than they're seeing what you, listening to what you say. I want to take a few minutes this morning and go over a couple of things that maybe help us in teaching others. And remember, this is a Bible class, not a sermon. I always like interaction both ways, particularly in this subject there's a book I've taught out of this book years ago in the back class. It's called Preparing to Teach Our Neighbors by Mike Tice. And I realize that all we need to teach is the Bible as far as the scriptures and the information. But we're all different people. How we teach each one is different. How you teach others is different than how I teach others and from how your neighbor teaches others. And sometimes it's easier if we know ahead of time things that may help us in teaching others. We're going to look in a few minutes at attitudes in teaching others. Because we know that how our attitude is and when we talk to others has a whole lot to do with how they listen, does it not? When people talk to you, if, you, if they have a particular attitude, how well do you want to listen to them? And then if we get to it, which you know my classes, I may not get there, uh, would uh, be a little bit on how we approach, because those are two different things. Uh, Do we have an option for teaching to others as a Christian? Is it an option? What's the Bible say about that? Carly, turn to Matthew 18 and read 19 and 20 in just a minute. Richard, if you would turn to Acts 8 and 4. When you're ready, Carly, go ahead and read. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Okay, it didn't say if you feel like teaching others, or if you wake up today and you want to teach others, what did it say? Go. And, and we understand that was the Great Commission sending out to go teach, but that's for all of us to do. And what was that last part that said, lo, I am with you always? Got to have faith. We got to have faith when we go teach others. We got to have that foundation of knowledge that will get that support. Will we make mistakes? You betcha. Are we perfect? Not at all. But we've got to try. We've got to do those things that we can to teach others. And once again, talking about this subject, I know there's some in here, probably all of you, that has something you can relate. So if we touch on a topic or something you, we've missed, 
then let me know because I, I want you. Unfortunately in life, most of us like to have our own experience for learning what's good and bad, particularly the bad. We won't learn from somebody else. So sometimes let's look at the good part and learn from others. So if you have something, like say, on teaching others, whether I've touched on it or not, if it's something that's appropriate that would help benefit, whether it's something don't do or something you should do, make sure you let me know. Talking about attitudes. Give me an attitude you should not have in trying to teach someone else. An attitude that you should not have in trying to teach someone else. Not, they don't want to listen. They're not going to change. Okay? We'll talk about that one. What else? I'm sorry? Say that again, Karen. Okay. We'll get into that in attitudes, but yes. Yeah, we don't want to get too defensive like in getting into an argument. Cause what, and we'll get to that. That's an attitude. I mean, an, uh, an approach on talking to people. What happens when you get in an argument? We'll discuss that. Because a lot of times, hmm, things get said that don't need to be said, right? You ruin everything. Anything else? Okay. That's that hypocritical argument. It's hard to tell somebody not to do it if you're they see you doing it. Others? Let's talk about, and we're going to get to some of those. One the author brings up, well, I don't want to talk, I'm going to call these excuses. They're bad attitudes is what we're going to talk about. We need to do the opposite of this. So, Excuses. Maybe that's maybe that's a question. Why? Let me ask that question. Why do you not want to try to talk to somebody about the gospel? Tell me why you don't want to talk to them. You don't want to teach them. Yes, they're not going to listen to me anyway. They don't want to hear what I have to say. Something else. I'm sorry? Lose a friend. Uh, you're afraid of hurting somebody's feelings or them hurting yours? You don't know enough? Well, there's an easy answer for that one. <laughs> and one thing about in this book, and we're not studying it today, it helps you grow on teaching because there's some things in here in this book and other chapters that, and I, don't, I don't, hate to get ahead of myself, but it's in another lesson anyway. You got to put yourself in their shoes and what do they know and what is their position. So maybe you need to know a little bit more about people and what they believe as far as then you'll know what their reply, you know a little bit more how they're going to respond to what you have to say. And I've said this before, the first time that I finally decided to talk to somebody when they knocked on my door, for years I didn't want to talk to anybody that was from a religious group knocking on my door. But I did find out if you've got like about three scriptures on the particular topic that they want to talk about, you don't normally have to get to that third one. Or if you do get to the third one, then they don't have it. Because you know what? They've already prepared. They know what you're going to say when you, they tell you. That's why they're knocking on your door. When you tell them what, what you believe in or what, uh, when you tell them that you're a member of the Church of Christ, God's church, then they don't probably know exactly what you're going to respond with when they tell you what they think. But if you can rebuttal that with about three scriptures, they don't want to talk anymore. Generally speaking, right then. That's just like you, you might have to go prepare for a second meeting. We got to be careful we don't fall in this same mold. 
one attitude we don't need to have is that he or she is less honest and open as I am. They don't want to listen. They don't want to listen to what I have to say. Well, I'm going to tell you, whether they're a non-Christian or a member of a denomination, they may be firmly entrenched in what they believe and think they're just as good a Christian as they need to be. So, if you question their integrity, what's going to happen? They're not going to get very far in teaching them, are you? Uh, so, what's it say about making that observation against about others? About thinking they're less open and not as honest as I am? Denise, would you turn to 1 Corinthians 2 and read 10 and 11? 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. Hey, no one knows the thoughts of others except who? God. Now, I know sometimes we are, make our funny remarks that my wife or my spouse or my husband knows what I'm thinking. And that might be true sometimes on our level, okay? But in general, on trying to read somebody else's mind, is that a dangerous practice? Could be. Because what's those saying, you know, take, take your foot out of your mouth and put the other one in? Sometimes when we think we know, and what happens with conversations when you think you, somebody else is talking? We're going to talk about that later on listening, but if we think we know what they're saying, how many times have you, someone, whether it's your family member, spouse, or a friend, they start telling you something, and you already start thinking what you're going to tell them to answer that or rebuttal that because you filled in the blanks of what you, the rest of that. You already thought you knew what they were going with that direction. And you didn't listen to the whole sentence. Or you got in on a conversation you heard part of and made an assumption of what they were talking about. We've got to be careful about thinking they're not going to listen. Because once again, do we have an option? We should be trying to present the gospel. All right, somebody made the comment about he may not, he or she will not change anyway. Uh, in Acts 9, what do we talk about in Acts 9? Do you remember? That's the conversion of Paul or Saul. Now, who would have ever thought he would change? Now, I realize there's a little bit of miraculous work in all that one, okay? But does that mean a person can't change? How many of you have known somebody that's changed that you would have never thought would have changed? I dare say if you think long enough, you might know somebody that changed. Of course, sometimes they didn't change for the better. I mean... They went from one religious belief to another religious belief and still not the right one. But we have to be careful about saying he will never change anyway. Uh, once again, who's going to make the increase? God says he'll make the increase, but what are we to do? So don't take the attitude, well, I'm not talking to that one because they're not going to change. You still need to try because you don't know. As we've said, you can't read minds. You don't know what may happen if you talk to them. Because back in Acts 2, they had Pentecost. What happened later after all that happened? They were preached the word, were they not? And what happened? 
Lots of people obey were converted, were they not? Weren't part of these people the same group that did what? They were there when Christ was crucified. They were in that same crowd. So we've got to understand. Uh, Jerry, you feel like reading? Turn to Acts 20 and 27. And while I'm at it, Luann, if you would turn to Ezekiel 3, 17, 18. And Leanne can turn to Acts 20 and 26. Another excuse we give. Uh, there's not much difference in what I believe and what they believe. I've talked to them. We've talked a little bit. There's not a whole lot of difference. There's some differences, but not a whole lot. What happens if you have seven spark plugs going in one? Don't, Richard. What happens? <laughs> Don't work too good, does it? Don't take but a little. Then take one. You got seven good ones. What's wrong with just having one bad one? Go open the combination lock. You got six of them. You got one of them that don't work. What happens? Or let's do your password on your computer. That's a good one there. What happens when you don't fight the hyphen or you don't capitalize a letter? What happens that pass? Don't work, does it? Well, same way. Just because you say, oh, not much difference. Well, a little bit makes a difference, doesn't it? It does. Does God tolerate differences? Does it matter how little they are? No. <laughs> so we need to understand that it doesn't matter. What's it say in 20 and 27, Jerry? Okay. All or the whole counsel of God. So can you just teach a little bit? Some of it? Oh, I got most of it down. Well, I'm just thinking... And, of course, my personal deal a lot of times in teaching somebody, it's nice to get on the same things you agree on before you jump out there and the things you disagree on. That's just me personally. Try to build up a good relationship with somebody on what you agree on, and then you both got to talk and discuss the things you may differ on. And uh, that's one of those things, if you've got it down where there's a lot that, you, that are a lot alike, that ought to be an easier battle to win. Sometimes, if there's not a lot of difference, I'll never forget the time I'd, a friend of mine for years that was a member of the Baptist church. He finally come to me. We hadn't talked money in a long time. He said, it's just not right. We've got to send in money, and somebody else decides where we send it, where that money's sent. I said, Hadn't we talked about that before? He goes, yeah, a long time ago. I disagreed with you then, but we ought to be taking care of where we, so we know what's being done with our money, that the gospel's being taught, what's being done is right. Instead of sending it to another organization, and that organization sending it what they think is right. So sometimes it may take a while on these differences, but, um, you know, What's it say? Uh, I'll, just, I'll hold just a minute. Um, you may find that it's easier to teach somebody over one issue than you think. Sometimes it can be very difficult. And of course, I guess... We talk about a while ago people come to your door. I've had a number of different groups over the year. I don't have that problem anymore right now. We've had one time somebody come out to our house out down in 66 acres off in the woods knocking on the door. You don't have that as much when you're out in the woods. But we did have somebody that come and knocked on our door inviting us to a, a meeting. But uh, those that do that 
yes, they may be a little more difficult to persuade. And I know you t we talked about the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses coming by the door. What's a good lesson we can learn from that? From them coming and knocking on your door? I saw your mouth move, Stacy. Their zealousness, their zeal. They're what? Persistent. See, can we not learn from others? How could we not be that way? Zealous, persistent. And I know that we look at it sometimes, why are you knocking on my door? Look at it from the half full. Maybe that's an opportunity for you. Because I will tell you, if you learn to talk to these people, you'll be stronger in what you believe in because you'll study. You'll look at the scriptures. You'll get better at what you know. But we, we got, we've got to take that zealousness and that zeal regardless. These people that come to your door and knock, are they, dis, are they uh, disillusioned? Do they take door slamming? They just quit doing it? They just keep right on that persistence. How do you handle things when somebody, you talk to somebody once, they don't want to talk, do you never ask them again? We have got to do better overall as a group of Christians to teach others and be as zealous in teaching others. All right, here's another excuse. What's it say in Ezekiel 3, 17 and 18? Luann? That's pretty strong words, isn't it? Somebody else can teach him. What happens if you do that? Lord's not going to be real pleased with you, is he? What does it say in 20, Acts 20 and 26, Lynn? Okay. Turn in your song books. No, we're not going to sing, but we're going to read. Turn in your song books to 598. 598. Just the chorus. You never mentioned him to me. You helped me not the light to see. You met me day by day and knew I was astray, yet never mentioned him to me. Do you want to have to be responsible of that to the Lord? You never mentioned that to that person? Well, that's what's going to happen if you say somebody else can teach him. I mean, judgment. We read in Ezekiel how that'll happen. We have got to make sure that we don't use these excuses. One more that we talked about on on these attitudes, and I call them excuses, they're bad attitudes, is what they are. We've got to do the opposite of them. It would be unloving to hurt his feelings by, or her feelings by bringing up religion. I think Karen phrased it, you're afraid of losing a friend. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. 
Well, Carly was talking about giving out the card that's got our website and information to it and how a lot of them don't go anywhere. And Kyle and I, I mean, Kyle's been mentioned at some. I know several of us have studied. People believe they can commune with God without having to be in a congregation. They believe that they can do just what they need to with the Lord. You know, it, it works a little different. Uh, they take something general and put it with worship. You know, I've been, years ago, somebody said, you don't ever go see, go to the cemetery to see your father's grave. I do, but I don't go very often. But I don't have to go to the grave to have my memories. And But that's different. That's a man-on-man -man thing. I mean, that's a physical thing here. Worship, you need to be there. But like you said, you gave them that card. They don't want to go. But it does have the website, which is what? A good young people thing to do. People like websites. They like to be able to do it on their watch, computer, phone, whatever. By the way, I didn't want to tell you, blah, blah, blah is out. It's now yada, yada, yada from what I can tell. I mean, that's what I see all the time now. It's not blah, blah, blah anymore. It's yada, yada, yada. But anyway, it's, it's something that, and I guess family is one we're real careful of. That's one we get concerned with. That's always a good idea when you can have other people that may can talk to them when it's family. But still, friends, co-workers, you know, you have to make effort. But there's different ways, and this book will help explore, say if we were doing the whole book, will help you explore some of those other ways to approach people in different ways. That's what this whole book is about, is trying to teach others without but in this case, hurt and feelings. Um, now, what's the bottom line? Somebody gets mad at you. Does it happen? Yeah. You betcha. Do they forgive you sometimes? No. But I guess our ultimate goal is that you want to save their soul, but obviously you've got to save your soul or try try to save your own soul, to teach, save other souls. And so my whole position, if they stay mad at you because you tried, well, come judgment day, they can't use that excuse we just read, you never mentioned him to me. So we have to make those efforts to do those things. Um, see if there's anything else... Uh, I want to say about this before we move on. Okay. Anything on those things we've talked about or do you have any other excuses that we want to cover? Yes. Okay. And that, Jerry was talking about being baptized at an early age, 14, and not, that wasn't because her family was that way, but she had an influence because somebody else complimented her about that. And in the long term, this person was baptized in her husband. Influence. You leave a lot of influence with the way you live your lives. Yes, teaching can be just not by talking to people. It can also be, of course, but the main thing as we talked about start with is how you live your life. Good point, Jerry. Um, turn to Jim. No, if you don't get saved by the bell. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9 and read 19 through 23.
Okay, and I mentioned this earlier today. Sometimes we have to put our position in the person we want to talk to position. What do you, sometimes a stranger you're not going to know much about. But by the same token, if you start your conversation and they make some comments, then you need to listen to those comments to help put you in that position. But if you know things about people, what they may already believe, what their positions in life are, then, and that gets into the second lesson in this book of some other things, but it does talk, the first thing I'm going to talk about here in a, in a, before the bell rings is something that goes along with this putting yourself in their position. If you're going to talk to somebody, does that mean you're going to do all the talking? Do what? But if they want to talk, you got to what? How good are we at listening? Not hearing. We hear good. Well, I think I'm supposed to get hearing aids, but anyway, generally we hear good. But how much listening do we do? <laughs> okay, perfect. We're talking about talking to somebody else that doesn't believe. Perfect. They're going to have to deal with that, but what else when they talk back to you? We don't hear what we want to hear. We don't want to listen either. We want to automatically jump back and defeat. We want to change your mind. We're not good at listening when we don't like what we hear. We just jump right back. And if we're talking to somebody that doesn't believe, then we're already, we're doing this thinking up here, what we're going to tell them to try to change their mind, right? But you know, if you listen long enough, two things happen. How is it, how is respect earned? Listening is one of those things. Particularly if you approach them about something you want to teach them about Christ. If you come in there to talk to them about Christ and the gospel, and they start to talk, and you go right down through there, how do they feel? Oh, well, they don't really care what I think. They're just going to tell me how it is, and that's the way it is. We've got to learn to listen, folks. Because sometimes they might actually ask a question. Or they might actually say more that is good than they have bad, that you've got something to work with. Or it tells you how their position is. Listening. We've got to listen to others when we talk. So if you think going and teaching the gospel to somebody means you're going to walk right in, spend 15 minutes with them, tell them how it is, that's what, that's, well, that's, well, they didn't listen, so that's, I'll move on to the next one. It's not, it's not that way, folks. And we know that. I'm just reminding you of that. That's, that's a good statement to make because instead of saying, well, that's wrong, and this is why, and turn to the scripture, it might be better to say, well, let's, let's study that. Let's see what's right. Let's, let's go and study. It's always got to be like Carly said. What does the scripture teach? All right. I'm glad you hopefully listened. We'll see y'all next time.